Once again, my name is Shannon Sarna. I'm editor of The Nasher. I'm so excited to be here with one of my favorite, favorite people, Cheryl Hobart, who is just not only the loveliest human being and the most talented baker. Um, I will share a little bit about her. Cheryl is a baker and teacher who integrates her love of challah baking with techniques and elements from her artistry and skill as a tapestry weaver. And I think if you've ever seen Cheryl's challah, when you hear that, um, it makes a lot of sense because what she does is so very, very artistic and intricate. Um, she won the Tip Tree World Bread Awards USA Showstopper. She's been featured in many, many online and print publications. She teaches all the time for King Arthur Baking Co., which I just uphold above all others. She was named one of the top trend bread bakers in North America by Dessert Professional Magazine. Um, and she just has an array of other accolades. Um, but most importantly, she is just the loveliest. And I hope you enjoy this class with her. A few ground rules. For those of you who have been with us in the past for classes, um, we will not be answering any questions during the teaching portion of this evening, which means Cheryl is gonna teach. She's gonna show three different round um, hala shaping techniques. She will answer a lot of frequently asked questions about hala because she gets them all the time. So give her a chance to teach. And in the last 15 minutes of the class, we'll open it up for some questions. Um, we're gonna try not to focus a lot on replacements, right? We have two recipe of Cheryl's, actually we have three recipes of Cheryl's on our site. Um, if you receive the email with the Zoom link tonight, you already have them because they were in the email. They're also featured on our homepage, thenosher.com. So if you're not sure where to look, that's a great start. I'll try to add them in the chat. Um, without further ado, I will shut up and spotlight her. Cheryl, thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us yet again. Um, thank you for, for being here and um, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Shannon, and everybody for joining, because more is more when it comes to challah. I'm so excited that you're all here. And I am an obsessed fan of Jewish food. I am a complete obsessed. I like literally like go there first <laughs> every day on my phone. <laughs> so I just love everything that Shannon's doing. And it's just, it's just such an exciting, I mean, and really, I wasn't prompted. I'm just a total fan. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, I am going to do three round halot. As we know, holidays are coming early this year. Somebody told me today, at, I was at the farmer's market, and I was like, wait a minute, I knew it, but did I really know it? So we're just going to launch right in. Um, there are so many round hala shapes we can make, and there's beautiful ones all over the internet. I'm going to kind of focus on something that is um, kind of royal, elevated, like a turban. Um, I um, do have Persian roots on one side, and I just can't help but think of turban and saffron. So we're going to get to that one at the end. It'll be something that is very special. Um, but I would like to start by scaling out our shapes. If you have made the recipe and you're baking along, if not, you can just watch and enjoy it, take notes for some questions later. Um, but what I typically like to do for something like a round challah, or the kind of shapes I'm going to show you, is I do like to scale them out. You can eyeball it. You know, I always say, as long as you're baking challah, whatever you do to get you in that kitchen baking challah, whatever it is, you can use as much as I'm going to explain to you or as little, because when you're doing it, there is nothing like baking your own challah. Um, and, and especially, especially for the high holidays. Um, but uh, that said, I do like to scale them out because you tend to get what you really are kind of hoping you'll get. Um, so here's my scale and I'm going to start off. I actually doubled the recipe so I could show you three. Um, my recipe that is on the nasher, you're, you're probably going to get two of these, but I thought, why don't we just go as far as we can and try to at least show three. Um, this is my dough that I actually made earlier today. I'm a fan of refrigerating dough. I not, I know, I know all bakers are not, but I am because we live lives. And if we're baking challah, there are wonderful ways, um, to refrigerate dough and sometimes it even improves the flavor today i was on the fly with a lot of other things so this was just like a straight mix coming right into the scaling so what i'm going to do first is just turn out you can see that um, it's very very soft and silky the dough um, and people often ask me 
Um, how do we know when the dough is risen? Is it doubled? Um, you know, it is. It is typically doubled, maybe more. It really depends on the dough. But what you really want to see is aeration um, with the dough. You don't have to kind of measure to see if it's doubled. You really don't. But you might want to see aeration. Um, be looking at that more. And it will feel silky and it will be sizably larger. Okay, so here is my dough. I'm going to start off with you can write these measurements down or um, what you can, this, this should get two, uh, two of these out of the recipe that's um, on, the, on the Nasher, on Jewish food. Um, but I always encourage people that you can, that's one other wonderful thing about a scale is you can weigh out, just put a bowl on your scale, tear it as I'll show you, and you can weigh out the bulk of dough and then you can divide it. You can do the math and you can make them as large or small as you want. You can make smaller ones, you can make larger ones, you can make one large one. Once you know the weight of that bulk, you can divide it and just tailor make it however you would like. I am doing 600 gram um, uh, shapes, 600 grams for each one. That will make about a one and a half pound challah, um, which is my typical size for like a regular Shabbat challah. Um, so I'm gonna start off with the first one Actually, the first one, I'm actually doing five, I do a little smaller. I'm doing a 500 gram, just one 500 gram piece, because I'm going to show you the way to get a beautiful one strand swirl. As you can see, um, I put this on, I hit tear, so it makes sure it's at zero, and I'll put a piece that's about 500 grams, and then I will just add pieces until it reaches about 500 grams. And that's about right. And I'll show you how we're gonna integrate those extra pieces in after. I'm gonna put a little extra. What we're doing now is called scaling and pre-shaping. Um, I think this is a really important step in hollow making because this is not only part of the process of making it light and a beautiful interior and crust, that thin, beautiful crust that we like, but it, was, it also has a lot to do with the way the shapes will turn out. Um, and if the curves will have definition and all of that. These are going walking through the steps of artisan bread techniques to just pre-shape it, let it sit, and then take your time to make the strands. Again, you can use as many or little as these steps if you like. If you just wanna take it off and start rolling, go for it. Whatever you like to do, because you might circle back at some time and say, you know, I think I wanna take it up a notch. I'm gonna scale it or I'm gonna pre-shape it. Okay, um, this, the first one is 500 grams. We're going to do a single swirl. And I wanted to show you how to do one well, how to do a beautiful single swirl, because at the end of the day, with all the fancy schmancy, beautiful round hollow, um, and I do them as well, there's just something so gratifying about that single swirl for Rosh Hashanah. Um, the second one I'm going to do is going to have five pieces. I'm going to do two pieces at 450 grams each. And no, I'm sorry, 225 grams each. So 450 for the two. So 225 grams each. And I'll go over these again. And here's another piece at 225 grams. And this will make sense. Just bear with me with the scaling and it's all gonna make sense, I promise. Okay. And those were two. So our first one for the single swirl is 500 grams for one, that could be 600 grams, that could be a smaller roll at 200 grams. I'm doing five, which is about a one pound challah once it's baked. A little more with raisins, which we're going to do. The second one I am doing, what actually was in a Jewish food article, and I, I tell everybody this because I thought it was so clever. Um, it, it's, it's, I'm calling it a challah within a challah, um, and you'll see why. So I'm gonna do my main swirls at, 225 grams each so that makes 450 and then i'm going to do three at 50 grams each so those will be considerably smaller so that's 40 grams this is 50 this is like what a 50 grand piece looks like it's quite small so there we're, i'm going to do three of those because what i'm basically doing is i'm going to inlay a three strand braid within a two strand twist, which is, it's just very pretty. And you can do all kinds of wonderful things with seeds, raisins. That's the challah everybody likes because there's something for everyone on it. 
And then the last one I'm going to do is going to be four pieces at 150 grams each. And that's going to be our fancy saffron turban. And so that will be, as you can see, 150 grams. I think that's a little more. That's 170. Um, okay, that's 150. And so well, all I'm doing is weighing them out now. I'm not pre-shaping them yet. I can take off if it's a little too much because I'd like it to be 150. Um, again, you can, you can make these whatever size you like, or if you're not in the mood for doing that, you can certainly, that was three and four. Eyeball it, whatever it takes to get you to make challah in your kitchen. It's all fair game. But I like to show my students all the steps I do to get it to look the way I do, because that's part of the reason they like taking classes with me is I make challah the way I'm making it. So I'm showing you all the steps that I use as an artisan baker um, who also does baking for customers. And I, I use all of those steps for sourdough for other things as well. Okay, it's just basic good bread technique. Okay, so here, just to review again, here is our 500 gram piece. Here is, that is going to be one swirl. The second one is going to be the hollow and then a hala. Thank you, Shannon. And that one is going to be um, 225, 225, 50, 50, 50. And then the third one is going to be the turban, the saffron glazed turban. And that one is 150, 150, 150, 150. Okay. So let me put this back in here. Okay. We are done scaling. Now what we're going to do is we're going to let them bench rest and I'm going to take the 500 and you know, I'm going to roll it over itself this way and I'm going to make a round. And you know, by kind of just folding it under itself this way, you know, you can squeeze it and pinch it if you want. I tend to do this and a kind of a loose round because we don't want it to be too resistant. It, it's gonna rest. I wanna be mindful of the time. It's going to rest, but we do wanna move forward with it. This part of the process is called a pre-shape. Um, it's it's pre-strand, pre-shape. And as I've said before, this step really helps to get the beautiful definition in the strands and the evenness that will also help create that definition. Okay, so that's just gonna sit and I might actually just cover that in a little plastic like that. That's food safe plastic bag. The second one, um, I'm doing that one round because I like to make them round when I fill them because I use a rolling pin and I like to roll it out from around. You don't have to, but I like to do that. The second one, you could use a rolling pin for this as well, or you could just press it. You're basically pressing it into a rectangle like this, and you want to try to get it as even as you can. Now that's, you know, it's not a completely even rectangle. I will say if you use a rolling pin, the evenness is really about the thickness. You don't have to make a perfect rectangle, but the evenness and the thickness is what really creates an even strand eventually, which creates challah that all comes together beautifully. So we're going to do that. You could just press it as well. You know, it's funny, I was pressing for a while because I was being very careful with, you know, I think if you kind of just hold it this way, you have to be a little careful if you're rolling a lot of challah. Um, and um, I, I kind of lost the rolling pin for a while, now I'm back to it. So it's, it's really what you want to do. And then what we're doing is we're rolling it in this way, toward ourselves this way. And we can basically press that little seam edge down and then just roll it, roll it to close the seam and you have a pre-strand. People ask me, this is probably about 10 inches, eight to 10 inches. And we're going to do that for the first one. We're gonna do it for the second one. I'll show this one without the rolling pin. It's really fine to do either, but I will say the rolling pin, it's, it's, it's really going to give you that nice, evenly distributed thickness. But no matter, we can do it this way too. And then we start rolling in this way. I basically use my thumbs as a guide. And this is the way you roll baguettes, by the way. You can either pinch or you can press the seam. 
I used poppy seeds the other day and I'm telling you these poppy seeds, they just like to be here forever. Um, like it's like glitter, you know? Yes. I was trying to think of the metaphor. I'm telling you, I, I did this King Arthur class last week. I mean, I had done poppy seeds before it and I was doing poppy seed management. I've been doing it for like two weeks. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, yes, it's glitter. That's what it is. It's glitter. Okay. Then we're going to just press the small one. Again, don't need to use a rolling pin and we're just going to roll it over itself. You can press down with your thumb like that. It presses the seam. Just give it a quick roll. We're not going to make them super long yet. And we're going to do it with all three. Okay. Rolling them on themselves. Press it just with your thumb at the end of the roll. I like to do that. It, it closes the seam. And here's another little trick when you're rolling a strand, even at this stage of it, um, rather than like pulling out, you're, it will rip, it will tear the dough. And it doesn't really accomplish getting it even. But if we press down in the areas that are thicker, just down. In fact, the best place to use is as this part of our hand and this part of our hand when we're rolling later and it rolls off the center like that. And that's the third one. All of these little steps seem picky, but at the end of the day, if I was gonna use the rolling pin, I would just do something like this. At the end of the day, they're creating evenness of dough, which equals evenness of strands, which equals beautiful challah. See that one, you can see how even it is because I used the rolling pin, but the other ones will be fine. These are only pre-strands. You know, they're, they're definitely not as long as we're going to get these down here so you can see them. Um, they're definitely not, they're gonna be longer than this for sure, okay? And then the third one, I think I will use the rolling pin because I've been doing that lately and it's been like faster because I'm like pressing and pressing to make it even. You'll also notice I'm really not using a whole lot of flour on the surface. This is called an enriched dough challah because it has, um, this particular one is not the water vegan, my water vegan recipe, this is the, the egg and honey. So there's oil in it, there's egg, there's honey. I'm pinching, that's one way of doing it. I'm rolling it under. Oh, it just feels so silky. I make so many different kinds of bread and just just nothing like challah, it just, just isn't. Okay, I've created this following at the farmer's market. There's not a lot of people up here that knew what challah is. I know we do have a shul in town, but everyone else is like, what's that? And now there's this huge demand <laughs> for the challah. I've been making these little ones and every week they're like, where's the challah? So it's kind of fun. It That's amazing, like Cheryl. And, and challah is so delicious. How could anybody not love it, you know? It's so delicious and it's so beautiful. And it's, it's the history of the Jewish people. I mean, it's just everything. This bread is just so amazing. and. It carries a presence with it and, and nobody can resist it. I made two huge, I'll just tell you this, two huge round wedding halot for a wedding in a very fancy place here last week and they weren't Jewish. They wanted challah. They wanted challah at their wedding. And um, I'm, how, you know? Challah so, is that's so, so, so lovely. Um, if you don't mind me interrupting for just one second, right ahead. there's some questions about how to see Cheryl. Okay. So let me just explain everybody. First of all, if you're on your phone or an iPad, you need to scroll over with your finger. Like, see what I'm doing? Oop, swipe, you know, swipe. If you're on your phone or your iPad, if you're on a laptop, it should come up for you. I don't have Cheryl's face highlighted right now, just her hands so you can see what you're doing. So if you can't see your, her hands, I'm not sure what to tell you, but try <laughs> swiping over and then it was, if you're, or changing the view, because there's a little button at the top of the screen, what I'm looking at on a laptop and it says view, and you can either be in gallery, which means you'll see everybody, which is over 400 people or speaker. So if you can select the speaker view and then you'll just see the speaker. Okay. I hope that helps. I, I don't have any more wisdom for Zoom to share other than that. I hope that helps everybody. Okay, I'm gonna go, mute myself and Cheryl, go back okay. to Okay, <laughs> right, okay, well, um, yeah, so, and this is, I think that's really a great way to do what Shannon's doing because then you can see, this is what we're all here for, to see what I'm doing here. And certainly you can look at my face later when we ask questions and 
Um, yeah, you know, Hala has a way of winning everyone's heart. I mean, what is not to love about it truly? Um, but you know, what we're doing today is very meaningful to us. And um, I do love making Rao Hala after making the long ones. Um, what this is now called, this is, these are pre-shapes. I call them pre-shapes. Well, they're called pre-shapes in bread baking. Um, but this would be considered a bench rest, which means this is the workbench, the work surface, and it's resting. Um, resting is a very important part of bread baking um, because if you're making gluten full instead of gluten free bread, um, the gluten is the, is the protein in the bread. It's basically the protein in the seed of the wheat. Um, there are two proteins. Um, and it is the extensibility that creates the rise, that creates everything we know from what bread is traditionally. Um, so that means that every time we handle it, when we need it, you might've seen when you've needed the recipe, this phase with the bench rest, it's going to get more elastic. It's going to resist me. So a, a big question that I get is that I'm trying to roll it out and it just is giving me a hard time. It's just not relaxing. It's not rolling. All we really have to do is let it relax. And so the bench rest is a time that it gets to rest. Um, I am going to, even though I weighed them or scaled them, the round one first, then I did the middle size one and well, the one with the two equal and three equal, and then the four equal. Um, because this is a big bulk of a round, this will take, and it's kind of a good little lesson here because this happens when we're baking. You know, we'll go back. In fact, I'm going to show you because I'm quite sure this, because it's a larger bulk, it will take longer to rest. So I'm going to start shaping these first because this is the largest bulk because it's a single piece. But why don't I show you what it does when it resists me? Okay. I had my... I don't really need it. Okay, so I have that. I have my rolling pin. And you can see that, you know, it's rolling out, but it's it's kind of not really coming out very much. It's, I have to work. I'd like to get it to roll out much wider and longer. And it's, it's kind of tight. It's not super tight, but it's kind of tight. If that happens in your process, I always get that question in class, always. Let it sit. You take it back to, there's my flour, and you just put it back on your work surface, cover it so it doesn't get like a film, and let it rest. Let it continue to rest. It can rest a pretty long time, a piece that size. So we're going to let that rest, and we're going to start with the second one. In fact, let me get these and put them here. Another little trick I have when I am making several is I will put them in different orientations, different directions. So I know these are all together. So I'm putting them vertically and this is a different one. So I'm putting them horizontally. It's just a little mental note. I mean, you can get masking tape and mark it or something, but I mean, how many of us are going to do that in the kitchen? Um, so these are going to wait because I know that this is a larger piece and it needs a longer bench rest than these. So I'm going to let that rest and we're just going to start with the first one. And I have the time here. Okay. We'll start with our, our big ones. Okay. And when we roll, we're going to roll evenly. Four round holla. In fact, I'm going to give myself a little more room here and move these over because you don't really need to see the resting. I think you get that. Um, for round holla, it's really important to roll the strands evenly. Um, when we're making beautiful, my favorite, kind of like the football shape holla, I love, love, love tapered ends on my holla. Some people like the blunt ends. I really love tapered ends. Beautiful for a traditional long holla. Round holla, it can be problematic to not make our strands even. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll this part and this part of the hand, and you can even hear it. When you're in baking school, they, they wanna hear it. So that's how I know I'm doing it properly. And it really does, the strand really does roll off my hand 
and it's a lot easier to get it even that way. If there are sections, like when you look at this strand that are thicker than others, all you have to do is apply pressure downward and it will even it out. Rather than saying, I have to do all kinds of crazy things, contortions to get it, you really don't. We just have to press down in the areas that are a little thicker and it'll naturally, as you can see, even out that way. Uh, okay, I am gonna do, we can do as long as I want to do this is as many kind of revolutions that it goes around because I'm going to do these two um, together in a two strand twist swirl. So we're working a little bit backwards. Um, I'm a big fan of a two, fan, uh, two strand twist swirl. I think it just gives it a little bit more of a fancy look. I think it's beautiful. Um, you see a bubble, you can just pop it with the heel of your hand. And here is my nice even strand. I can show you on a diagonal. I bought right here my trusty tape measure because everyone always asks how long these are. These are, this is, this is 30, about 30 inches, 29 to 30 inches. That is what I'm doing. If I wanted a twist that was like a little more plump, I might go 24 inches, but I would say 24 to 30 inches is nice for this because this is a fair amount of dough. This 225 grams is a fair amount of dough. I'm gonna start rolling again, just outward from the center outward, pressing down. If I have bubbles, I will press. Sometimes it's gotten so soft the dough because it's weighted that I literally give it another fold over that way and get the bubbles out. If I create a new seam, I simply close that seam again. Because we really want it nice and even, this is not a phase where I really want bubbles. I want a nice, you don't have to go crazy. I mean, if there's a little bubble, it's okay, no harm done. But I tend to really roll them out to where I don't have bubbles all over the place for this because actually when it bakes, um, the crust will be thinner in that part and it could even burn a little bit. So again, not a terrible thing, but even is the way to go. I can see that my center is a little thicker. So I'm just pressing it. I have some bubbles and I'm doing the same length that way. And what I like to do is get something like a weight, like my bench knife. And tell me if I have to do something with the light. I tend to have a little bit of a yellowy light. I can turn it up here. Um, I like to weight it with the bench rest. These are nice. The, the very ends are tapered. They are even, but the very ends are tapered so that I can join them and make one out of two. So they do have to be thinner. I'm going to put my bench knife and I'm going to, this is like super fun. I'm just going to swirl them around each other like this. And when you do this, it does come out quite even. You can see that the center is a little thicker. It's okay. I just don't want it so much thicker. Cheryl, can, can I ask you a question? Sure thing. Um, one of the things that you taught me that I um, thought was such a game changer for challah was about braiding. And that yes. when you're braiding, you want to keep your braids loose, yes. right? So that they have room to expand when they're, when they're baking and then they pull less. Um, when you're twisting it, are you doing the same thing? Is it a loose twist or is it a tighter twist? You know, the t that is an excellent question. Um, you know, it's, I find that when I weight it down and I kind of throw it around itself, it is, it's just right. Um, I think personally, I think it's a little bit tighter than a normal braid in a twist. And I think because it's only two strands, I think because it, um, because of the, the shape of the twist. It isn't, you know, the strands of the plates of a braid. It seems to be able to handle being a little tighter, but not super tight. And I think that's why I kind of throw the pieces over each other because that way it's not, it's not loose, so to speak, or as loose as when I do a regular braid, but it's also not like tight um, because it could be very tempting to make that tight. So we're still going by that rule to not make it super tight, but in the case of the twist, I find it can be a little tighter than in the regular braiding. I think also the braiding has so much going on. You know, there's, there's three, there's four, there's five, there's six, um, that there's a lot more room for that unequal distribution. Whereas a two strand twist is pretty straightforward. And I haven't had issues with that being a little tighter in this particular 
two strand twist. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, I take a look at it and what I like to do, like this end is a little bit thicker, so I will literally just roll it out a little thinner and go around each other. See, to, to Shannon's point, I'm not going like that. I am just laying it nicely that way. And then what I like to do for a two-strand twist is I like to just turn it in on itself this way. Here's Shannon's point, though. I do turn it in on itself a little looser rather than tight because what's going to happen is it's just going to push up and you're not going to get much of a swirl. So I'm leaving a little room here, like Shannon talked about, in between the swirl. I am leaving a little room and then I take that little end and I stick it under like that and I'm going to put it on a baking sheet. So you can see there's a little space in there to Shannon's point. And that, I like to do that because I definitely get more definition in the swirl when I do that. If I want it to really come up, like one of them I was making like an ascending spiral, you know, I, I might kind of tuck it under itself and make it a little tighter, but you're gonna get the most definition this way. Just like when we're doing a little, and so you can even see, I have a little space in there. Okay. Okay, so that is, and there's another reason we're doing that for this, which you'll see in a second. In fact, I'm gonna give it even a little more space and we'll see why. It's gonna rise, but put this aside. I'm gonna grab a little drink of water. That's so interesting that you even allowed a little space because it makes sense. It rises so much even now when it does arise and then when it bakes. But what, a, what a small, subtle thing that I bet makes a big difference. You know, it is. And yeah, it makes such a big difference. Um, I actually learned that from Maggie Gleaser. There are very few hollow bakers that I have ever really talked about that. But she was the person, she's the first baking class I ever took many, many years ago when my kids were really little. And I just, I'm telling you, I just, it was life changing to take a class with her. And she was big on that. So I have to give her credit for that um, as well. So my three strand braid, I could go super long. I'm not going to go too long on it because I want to kind of inlay it. Oh, there's a little bubble the hollow within the holla. Is that like the coolest name for a bread ever? I mean, to this day, I was just like, I saw that in that article. I was like, I'm using it. <laughs> so I tell everybody that. Um, but that was the best. Okay, so I've got the one. We're just doing a simple three strand braid. In this case, you know, it's okay if it's a little more tapered. But again, I'll keep it somewhat even. These are, let me measure them. Um, just kind of want to keep them even. As you can say, one's a little longer, so I'll Go and roll it a little longer again to keep them even. I want to keep them um, also with the seam side down. It's not a catastrophe if the seam's up, but it is nice if it's down. Okay, and there we go. I'm gonna measure it for you. I do with my measuring. Here it is. Okay, and that is yeah. That's that's a good twelve. That's eleven to twelve inches. Okay. Now we are just going to pinch it at the top, do our simple braid, like this, okay? I try to keep the seams down. This is where I am a little bit looser. Pinch the ends down, and then I lay it in. I go to the center, I actually open it up. Time for you all. And I, I actually go right to the center here of that swirl, which is why we do want space for this. And I take a pointy end. Sometimes there's usually one that's a little longer and pointier. And I literally put it in, into the center. And I lay it in that little bit of space that I've left. I just kind of lay it in there. And then I stick it through the space. And it looks like this. Wow. It is that a is really within a challah. And the cool thing we're going to do with this is you can do raisins if you like, which I'll show you with, with the, the big piece. Um, this is the challah for everybody because you can either do it just the way I've done it and glaze it all with egg wash, or if it's vegan with maple syrup, uh, which is my preferred 
place for vegan. Um, you can leave this, I tend to leave the inner one plain with no seeds or no raisins. And I tend to take all of those beautiful curves that are on the outer and um, glaze it and put different kinds of seeds on that. So you've got seeded, you've got unseeded, you might wanna have a section that is completely with nothing in it. The other section has raisins and it's kind of exciting. And it's also exciting when you're eating this Paula that it's different with every bite when you tear it off. It's, um, it's an experience. <laughs> Okay, I think this, I'm just going to leave this for now. A lot of bakers uh, like to glaze their kala. I'm going to start rolling the four as we're talking. A lot of bakers like to glaze their kala now before the final proof. The final proof is the final bubble rise. Um, mine usually takes about 45 minutes at 70 degrees Fahrenheit in a kitchen. Ambient room temperature, as we say, mine takes about 45 minutes. Um, could be a little longer, shorter, depending on the weather. What we're really going to look at, which I will talk about when I glaze it, um, is that the hala is aerated, thinning under the surface and visibly larger. It doesn't have to be like, you have to wait till it's double. Sometimes that's not the best thing because it, it might or might not double. It's better to just get used to what the dough feels like. Okay, so this one, we are going to do a two strand twist again as the center like that. Okay, um, here we go. In fact, we're going to do two, two strand twists. So this, I have rolled it out this way and they're quite long. And now I'm going to go to the other two and I'm actually letting those rest because I'm going to roll them out even longer because they need to make a border, a border for my beautiful turban crown. Um, and in this case, because I want something like a turban crown, I'm not going to make the center as thin. I'm going to make it a little thicker so that I have that real turban look with a border around the edge. Now there's all kinds of variations you can make on this type of turban crown. I am doing two, I'm doing four of equal size. It's very simple to do and it's very dramatic. Um, you could do, you could divide the outer ones in half and make them, we see a lot of that right now on social media. We see a lot of taking each strand and dividing it equally. So we're doubling and tripling the strands. You can do something like that. I do that for another design that I do. You could do a three strand braid instead of a two strand twist. But I think, honestly, I'm a big fan of a two strand twist. It's simple and it's just so beautiful. And it, it really looks like that turban look, which is just gorgeous to me. Okay, so here's one, here's the other. Um, this is not quite as long as the other one. This one was this. This one is, it's like more like 20, 21 inches. And I'm going to, again, we'll talk about what we did before. I'm going to make my center. And I'm going to, you see how I'm just kind of, I mean, I'm literally like throwing it this way, right onto the, see? Instead of going like, tight that way. I mean, it's, it's doing, you know, it, it's actually, it's twisting because if it doesn't twist, then you don't get the twist. So if it's super loose, you don't get the twist. But for me, when I'm throwing it, I'm not doing that like super tight tension on it. Maybe that's a way to look at this one. So I still have enough room for that last rise, but it's not quite as loose as the other parts of the process. Okay. Here's the end. I like to turn it on itself this way. And I'm leaving a little bit of room, not quite as much as the first one because I'm not going to do an inlay of another braid. So it'll be somewhat, somewhat space, like a space, but just maybe a little, a little bit more cohesive that way. Okay, and that one will be on the next sheet like this. Okay, so that's our center. That's the center. Sometimes I'll take that very end and really get it under there so it doesn't pop out like that. Okay. 
And now I'm going to go back. I'm going to give myself lots of room here. Get my uh, industrial tape measure here because I used to have a nice tape measure for my weaving. And then I had another one, then I had another one. For some reason, I cannot hold on to a tape measure. I don't know why. That's the one I can hold on to. Now I'm going back. You'll see that they have been resting and I am going to make them longer because what's going to happen is when I twist it, it's going to get shorter. It's going to tighten up in a way. So it's going to be shorter than this. Um, I like to go to the first one and say, okay, if I were to take that and go around, it's going around, it's going around this. Let me show you. And I've got a good quarter on each side of the length. That's about right. And if it's longer, better yet, because I can twist it and finish that edge. Okay, so that's about right, I think. Longer is better, you can always cut it shorter. You're kind of struggling to make the border work. Although, there's always a little hack, there's always a little trick. And one trick you can do is if this is too short because you did not make it long enough, just get another piece of dough, do another twist about the same thickness. You don't even have to measure it. I do this kind of cheating all the time. Um, and just kind of twist it in the place that it didn't overlap or the, the place that it didn't meet. You, there's nothing that says you can't put a piece in there. When you do, um, I mean, you can't tell when it's baked. You really can't. So now you can see that this isn't perfectly even. That's okay. We're going to work with that. We're going to go back to this and we may even go around more than once. We're going to look, it's a little bit thinner over here. So I'm going to take the thicker to balance and put it like that. And I'm going to go around here like this. And that overlaps really nicely. And what I like to do so that I don't have too much bulk for the overlap is where the overlap is, I will trim. So I will trim this here because mine was longer, which is fine. It gives me something to play with. I just trim it right off and I twist and tuck like that. And I will see, you, you can see that it looks pretty cohesive. It really looks like a turban or a crown. Yeah. I love that myself. Okay, now what I might do for this one, even I might take the edge around here and I might scooch the very edge of the border underneath it to kind of lift it up a little bit to get that real turban. By the way, these are probably the crowns. It wasn't the kind of like English crown. It was more of this kind of crown in the Middle East, which is kind of cool. Okay. And we're taking it up a Middle Eastern notch with saffron. Okay. So that's that one. And we can always, you know, tweak around this. That's our second. Okay. It's drag weed season. And I live in the woods. I just went through the yard and took out a lot of ragweed, but apparently there's a little more. Okay. Um, it's been so much rain, big year for ragweed. Right. I will put a bag and make a little proofing area. That's another thing I do. If you can go to these restaurant places, <clears throat> which I don't endorse anyone, but you might be able to get a food safe bag, a restaurant depot type place, or maybe a, you know, like a big box kind of place or something. Um, so that's that one. And take another little sip. Now we do our, our single, which it never lets us down. A single swirl will never let us down. It's so beautiful. And this is considerably, got raisins here, considerably softer. I'm gonna think about kind of a rectangular shape as I'm rolling out. Really good to roll from the center outward. Center outward, center outward, center outward, center outward. This, I would recommend using a rolling pin. I've seen people add fillings without that. I don't recommend that. The seam can pop open and you don't really get um, filling. You get like a whole lot of these big plate pieces, uh, parts of it that don't have filling. 
So just doing this step, you're going to be much happier. And I'm trying to get this as even as I can. And I am rolling quite thin. I am rolling quite thin. I mean, this is like a sixteenth of an inch or something. It's not paper Earl, thin. Do you ever um? Do you ever add uh, like raisins or chocolate chips or seeds or nuts directly to your dough? I actually don't. Um, I was I was taught I was taught that I think chocolate chips would probably be fine. Um, I think raisins because it's like hydrating, so it's like dry technically. I mean, it's a picky, it's a picky own thing, but it's technically drawing a raisin unless you really, um, here's another point. Lots of times we soak people, we are told to soak the raisins. Um, you know, it can be problematic unless you, if you're putting it in the beginning, that's fine because you can definitely do either. But if you soak the raisins and then do this, it really creates like sliminess around too much, and too much moisture right well it really does, it because the, I, the, the, I have never found i have needed to soak the raisins i mean i guess if they were like 10 years old you know but then we're not going to use those so if you have pretty decent raisins that you've just bought um i don't know if i i have my cursor there i don't think you can see that i can okay um so i just roll this out take your time it'll roll out beautifully and um, oh, oh, to that point, I, you know, I just, I just like to mix the dough straight off and I like to add whatever filling it is this way because I might decide to add like za'atar and, and olive oil. I might like to decide a chocolate filling like I might for babka. I mean, it's literally anything. My friend, oh my gosh, one of the best fillings for a challah my friend did was she sliced thin dates and Parmesan cheese. Crazy, craziness. It was so good. I'm like, how did you think of that? Her family apparently used to have contests with both challah and um, latkes. Uh, they would have contests of who could come up with the craziest things. And she's kind of the queen at like combos like that. And that is, oh, the saltiness. So if you're doing like, you know, dairy meal, ooh, really good. Um, so I then just put these, you can definitely mix them in the beginning. That's fine if that works for you. And, and I think if your raisins are, you know, somewhat soft, it will sort of condition the raisins. Um, but it's fine. You can do it either way. I'm, I'm just used to making big amounts of dough and doing different things with one batch. So, you know, if I do this, I can do one like this. I can do one with chocolate. I can do one with, you know, a smear of uh, cinnamon and whatever I like. Okay. So then I will start I, I do leave a border. I hear an inch. I, I hear people say an inch. I tend to like to do a half inch because I don't like big. I'd rather kind of manage manage it than um, have big sections. And I'm going to really, this is where I stretch and roll it over itself. I stretch and roll it over. Hey, hey Cheryl, about how big is that rectangle that you roll? Oh, out? okay. Great. Sure. Yes. That rectangle is about 10 by, I've got 10 by 14 or 15 here. Nine, yeah, about nine or 10, nine and a half by 14. But that doesn't have to be exact, right? No. You roll it out. Definitely not. You nope. know, it, okay. what it really is is, you know, I do like it a little longer, I will say. I would try to go by the 15, at least that, even if you're not as wide, because it's not easy rolling. If you want to roll something longer with like raisins in it, it tears really easily. And the longer you can make this now, you're rolling less later. So here, I'm gonna really give it a pinch. Sometimes I even, I can see the, I'll stuff a couple of raisins, like, cause I want it to be, I want filling. So I'll really pinch it. And then I'm carefully going to roll it this way. And you might see some raisins pop out, perfectly fine. This is where the rule of not going out and going down is really important because if you, if you pull out too much, the tearing and raisins popping out and all of this, again, not a catastrophe. You can kind of pinch it. I've done every single thing like that. Um, but the more evenly we roll it out before we put the raisins, the better off we are. And 
this is, I mean, however long we want this to go will be how many revolutions we are in this world. I, I can see, you see how this is starting to come through now? You can see raisin coming through. That's like, okay, good enough. I don't need to like keep going and keep going until it rips, although I have ripped many. I've ripped plenty of, plenty of polish with raisins and you know, you just kind of stick it under and pinch it and it's perfectly fine. But I'm supposed to show you something a little better. <laughs> and it is to that point, it really um, is wonderful when you learn the way to do it that that's gonna happen the least. It's not frustrating and you, you really get something beautiful and very cohesive. So I am still going to do tapered ends. You can see it's quite even in the middle, maybe a little fatter in the middle, but I want my ends to be so that I can twirl them. If I see, there's quite a lot of raisins in here. So if I see those seams popping, I'm gonna pinch them. And then I am going to do the same thing, except this one, I tend to swirl it around itself. This way, definitely want the seam down and a nice thin end to go under. And that is like our raisin filled swirl. I also like this with a little bit of space. Um, I even leave a little space in the middle because I do like that kind of definition. So that's our swirl, our raisin swirl. And now um, I'm going to do some glazing. We have a couple minutes left here. But just to show you this, this is a really important finishing. I literally take it out and I make sure it's nice and long and thin because that way I can stick it under and it's not going to pop open and start to unravel. Okay, so that's that one. That's our swirl. I could have made that longer and gone around, but I just think a simple swirl for this shape is just so pretty. And plus with the raisins, it is nice if it's not super thin because it'll be fluffier. If we were to make something with raisins like really like thin and roll it out so that we get a lot of times around, um, it'll be very pretty and it'll be delicious, but it's not gonna be as fluffy in the interior because it needs a little more, um, I do twisty ties for this. It needs a little more bread around the raisin to rise and become fluffy. All right, I'll do a simple egg wash. I'll take questions whenever Shannon says, but I'm just gonna go right for the saffron egg wash. Here is my mortar and pestle. I have a pinch of saffron in here. Um, I really take this from Persian brewed saffron, which technically I should be putting sugar in here. I don't do that step. If you really want very smoothly uh, ground saffron, you just put a tiny pinch of sugar and the, the roughness of the sugar, the, the friction of it helps you to grind the saffron that it's not at all stringy. I don't mind that. I'm gonna be straining this anyway. Um, and I tend to not you know, really get all crazy about that. Then lots of times to make this, we're basically making brewed saffron, which is used in Persian cooking. It's just for tadig and rice. Um, what I'm going to then do also is I, I want to get hot water. So you have to just excuse me a minute so I can get pretty hot water. Um, I see a couple of questions start coming in. I'll start feeling them to you. Donna, you're asking us about um, bread flour. Is that kind of flour essential? And I will answer that and say, I, I believe it really is. If you really want a good um, a, a good quality challah. Bread flour yeah. has higher gluten, higher protein, and it will make your strands stronger. So I would, right. I would, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn for Cheryl. Oh, no, no. Listen to Shannon. Um, you know, you can use, of course you can use all purpose flour, use, you know, what you have, but that bread flour is higher in protein, which equals higher in gluten, which equals, um, you know, you're working it an awful lot. You're working challah dough an awful lot where we're, we're, we're pre-shaping, we're rolling, we're doing strands, and it holds up to all of that work. I've got some. So basically what I'm doing now is I am going to, I'll do two, I'm gonna do two eggs, and I'm going to take half a yolk out of one of the eggs. If I was using one egg, I might take like a third of the yolk out. 
I like to do that for this because what it does is there's less browning. That was a trick I got from my friend Tammy at Karma Bread. But darling, you do not have to <laughs> use the whole yolk. I said, you're right, of course. I am putting, that was about a tablespoon of water with a pinch of saffron. And that is, lots of times people, look at that color. <gasps> it's so exciting. Um, it's just, this excites me every time. I mean, it never gets old, never. And then, you know, you can just brush it on that way or you can strain it through a strainer. It's going to be, this is kind of a finer strainer, so I don't know how much it's gonna go through, but it's going through. Um, and there it goes. And so Cheryl, I'm wondering if you can talk through the process yeah. of your pre-ferment, when you do that step, yes. your dough, and when you refrigerate it. So just walk through the timeline for people so they understand what that looks like. Okay. When, um, I'm a big fan of pre-ferment. A pre-ferment is something that, this is a very short pre-ferment, and then I will just be glazing this as we go, which is basically just in the direction of the, the, the curves of the strand. Um, so, okay, let's see if I can find, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of pre-ferment. You can technically, you can absolutely throw everything in together. You can do that. You can take all the ingredients and throw them all in at the same time. A pre-ferment starts, it starts the process. I believe, usually they're longer, they can be like overnight and it's called a poolish in bread baking. Um, there's different kinds of different traditions that are called different things. But what it is, is it's starting the fermentation process. Um, it will start the absorption of um, water and flour, which is really important because lots of times we end up using a lot more flour than we need to, but it's because we didn't give time for some of the flour to absorb the water. And when it does, we find we sometimes don't need as much as we thought. Um, it also develops flavor, um, and there's all kinds of ways to, to do that process. Um, I, I mix the pre-ferment, as in the recipe. I let it sit about 20 minutes. And, but again, you could do it all together if you don't want to do that pre-ferment. You're not going to see a noticeable difference, but I, I actually think the bread's a little more tender when I use it. Um, and then you add to that pre-ferment, which is basically flour, water, and your yeast. You'll beginning, you'll see it swell. Not a lot of fizzy bubbles like seltzer. We don't want fizzy because that's a little bit um, over fermentation, a little too much fermentation. Um, but... Uh, just to where it's like swelling and you're starting to see bu bubbles. It's, it's getting bigger, it's swelling. Then add your eggs, your honey, um, mix that and your oil. If you're doing the vegan version, you just add the oil. And then what I do is I, I beat that all, I beat that all well. And then after that, I add my dry, which is basically flour and salt. Um, it's okay to add salt at any point of the process because you've already had a mixture of flour and, um, and, and the yeast, uh, the word out there is that it really doesn't kill the yeast if you do it with the salt, but there's really no reason to just put salt next to yeast anyway. Um, so that's, and then from that point, I mix it all well. I like to use my hands to see if it's like pushing back and resisting, um, but yet it is pliable enough to knead it. And then I knead away. Sometimes I walk away from it for five minutes I am a big fan of that. Just a couple of minutes while you maybe clean some things or organize things. And that allows the flour to absorb uh, the water. And you're probably gonna use a lot less flour and it will be easier to knead. And then you knead it and let it, what we call bulk fermentation um, or rise. Uh, I, mine will rise about an hour and a half, two hours if it's a cold kitchen. If I'm putting it in the refrigerator, I will let it get a start for about 20 to 30 minutes. And then I just might press it down and deflate it, cover it well, plastic wrap or a bucket and put it in the refrigerator. Um, if I do it around dinner time or in the afternoon, I just kind of check it before I go to bed and I just deflate it so that it doesn't over rise. Because what we don't want is, is it to rise and then fall down on itself. 
It's not a catastrophe. This, that would be not good in the final proofing stage. It's not a catastrophe, but if we just go in there and deflate it, you get a lot of flavor from overnight fermentation. And the best part is, is you get to decide when you're ready to, to continue the process if you have other things you're doing um, and you're not just only available to the challah. Um, the next day I will take it out about an hour, half hour to an hour, and then I will proceed the way I did with the scaling of the pieces. It's, by the way, you can go several days, two or three days. Each day, if you take it out, just give it a good knead for 30 seconds, round it and put it back in. That re, um, reactivates the gluten. And I find that you, you can go, you know, two days, even three. And first day, it's the fluffiest. Um, and it's a little less because the gluten strands do break down in the refrigerator, but it's still wonderful. And, you know, and sometimes you even want to do that. Sometimes you don't want it as fluffy because if you're doing a design, you want to see um, in certain parts of it uh, a little more, something more streamlined. So th that's where we learn to manage fermentation as we go. But that's a general rule for using refrigerator, refrigerator with the, the, the mixing process. Okay, I'm going to put this over. This is already, this, so a lot of people, as I was saying, they will, they will glaze it now. They will cover it. They will let it proof completely and glaze it again. You get that real lacquered look. Um, I tend to just let it completely proof and just make sure that I egg wash it very, very well. Um, this needs a little more time because as you can see, it is softer, um, but it's coming back when I, I'm getting a little bit of an indentation but it still comes back and fills in the indentation so it's not ready to bake. This will be ready when it's a little larger. I can feel under my fingers that the surface of the dough is thinner and when I press it, um, it just kind of stays. It, does, it comes back just a little. It might come back just a little. But I'm gonna give this a little more time for that. So a lot of people have asked about the, that plastic bag that you're putting your dough in. What is that called? I am where telling you, I'm gonna sell one? it. <laughs> Because I mean, I feel like bakers really need these plastic bags. Um, I should, I mean, I'm doing a couple things with my bakery and one of these days, everyone's gonna get these plastic bags super cheap because I get them from a distributor. I get them from, um, oh, I get them from, um, I used to get them from a place here that used to do paper and plastic. People tell me they can get it at Restaurant Depot and you don't need, and I would call, you don't need like a tax ID number, I don't think. I don't know, but I don't think like for a business. Um, Uline is another one. It's called Uline, U-L-I-N-E. Um, I used to have a distributor here, but they just like went out of business during COVID. So I'm going to have to, I haven't gotten the big ones yet, but I think you can get all kinds from like Uline. And this, these are, let's measure, these are like, you know, they're like 20 four by, you know, like 13 or 14. They just want like that kind of size. But I would try around. I might even like Google like food safe, large plastic bags, or I know those distributors like Uline, I think um, they're kind of my new distributor now because my other one closed. I've heard you can get it at re Restaurant Depot. Um, so those kinds of places that sell like restaurant things, um, and it's basically a large food safe bag, but it, it makes such a great proofing environment that one of these days I'm going to have a fulfillment <laughs> little division and I'm just going to mail these out to everybody so everybody can have them because they really, they're really wonderful. Cheryl, uh, we're, we only have time for a few more questions. So I'm really going to focus on the ones that are worthy of Cheryl's expertise. So forgive me, we're not going to get to every single small question. Um, and some of the questions you guys have, I think you could Google them and also find the answer easily. But Cheryl, what, could you talk about gluten-free challah baking? Yes. And if there's flours or flour mixes that you would recommend some over others. Okay. Um, you know, I have a friend now who really seriously needs gluten-free. It's not something I ventured into because I wanted to do it with integrity. Um, uh, there, I would look for a gluten-free flour mixture that is mostly rice flour baked. I have one that I can tell you the name. I'm not like a product endorsement. I just found a recipe online and what attracted me to it was I could braid it. I could braid it. Here's another important point. 
I could braid it because of the techniques I showed you, because we, I divided it, because of how I roll it, and I press down and not out. That's where that technique really came in. So you can go two ways. You can get these flowers like Bob's Red Mill, King Arthur has a really nice one that you can do like pancakes, and you don't have to use yeast. You can use other leavening agents um, and you know baking powder and these things, and you can get a mold. Uh, the mold is quite pretty, really. And if you end up washing it um, with an egg wash or fancy saffron, and then you put seeds, it's going to be beautiful. Um, I'm going to take a look because I, I just have this one that I got for my friend. It's in my cabinet here. Um, and it made nice hala for him. He went nuts. He went absolutely nuts. It was this JF, like gluten-free jewels, like J-U-L-E-S, I'll show you here. Um, I, I got this because I saw a recipe and they were kneading and you could use yeast. So I was like, I wanna, I mean, they were need, not kneading, they, I'm sorry, they were braiding. I was like, I wanna braid it. I mean, even though, I mean, the mold thing is very nice, but I really wanted to braid it. It's part of the experience of making challah. If you're careful and you do what we did here, divide it nicely, really give it um, all the attention we gave it in those steps, you will be able to braid it. It's not gonna feel the same as gluten, but it's gonna be pretty darn nice. And another trick I did was I rolled seeds. I took the strands and I washed them and I rolled them in seeds and then I braided them and it came out really good. I did one without seeds, but the one with seeds came out beautiful. So that's my... <laughs> It's, it's a little bit of a journey for me. What I'm going to do now is just in the different sections, I'm going to put seeds and I'm going to leave the inner three strand braid. I'm going to leave that. I have my jello seeds. I I have, oh yeah, I do. Nigella. I like to add Nigella in the center. It's so pretty. So if, yes, so that would be my thought on it. And that is a rice, a real rice based. I use a um, philium husk. So I don't, I, as I said, I'm not, I'm not per se a gluten-free baker. That's a whole other um, art form of baking. But that particular flour, which was mostly rice flour based, um, worked well for me to braid it. So, and it was delicious. I mean, I have to say, I mean, I, it was, it was good. He went nuts. <laughs> he was like, I can't even believe I'm eating this. Okay. Um, Cheryl, could you talk about, sorry, we had a, a question that came up and I think this is an important one because it's, yeah. there could be so many factors, right? Yeah. Um, Michelle is asking, why is my challah dough sticky? Why is it sticky? Um, you know, it, it could be because you need more flour. It could definitely be because you need more flour. Um, so if it is, is it slack and sticky or like stiff and sticky? Because if it's slack and sticky, that means you definitely need more flour. There's not enough flour in the, and, and sometimes that's like a hard thing. You're like scaling out the flour in the recipe. And if it's- He says super, it's, sla it's slack and sticky. Yeah, you can you definitely use more flour. And um, sometimes it's, you know, even though you're, you're scaling it out, it's, um, you can see I like tweak little things. I take seeds out. I did like do that all the time. Um, so I would definitely add more flour. And when I, the, the best time to add it is during the kneading process. So I like to add the flour to the work surface instead of like dumping it all over the challah. Be a little more generous when you add it to the work surface. And when you do that, um, knead as you go. Because the two things that will mediate that stickiness are kneading it more, developing the, the gluten so that it is more firm and extensible and adding a little bit more flour as you go. That's what I would recommend. Um, this, is a, this is another good question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so somebody asked, can you use a bread machine for, for making the dough? And um, I would say you need to look for a bread machine recipe because I think it can be different. So that, that would be my suggestion. Cheryl, would you? Yes, would you I would 100% agree. You can definitely do it. 
when you get to the point, you know, you're going to bring it to the point that, um, uh, you know, you have dough to work with and you can braid, but definitely use a bread machine recipe. Follow those directions. Don't use, just, don't use a standard challah recipe. You want to look Correct. for a bread machine recipe. Yes. Um, how, for how, how long and at what temperature will you bake your challahs? Uh, okay, show? so these, these will be at 350 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, internal temperature, I like 190 to 195. I, I tend to actually like 195 um, because I tend to like a little more caramelized crust. Um, so I do take an instant ring thermometer and I stick it in one of the crevices and, you know, I mean, I've gotten to where I can tell, I like the way it looks on the outside, but if I'm, if I'm just sort of developing that, I will do that temperature. The, the, uh, the, the vegan, I bake at a higher temperature because you don't have the egg and, and the honey, so you don't get the same kind of browning. So if you bake it more at 400, I mean, it's kind of my, I'm kind of going back and forth a lot with the vegan. Um, but if you bake it more at like 400 degrees, um, for 20 to 25 minutes after I glaze it with a little bit of diluted um, uh, maple syrup. That's a nice glaze for that. I find that you get a very pretty matte finish and it has that nice browning. So that's I a little higher. I love the design you're making where you can see the swirl of the braid, but then you have the seeds coming around it. It's really stunning. Yeah. And um, thank you. So, uh, I got a couple little stragglers. I kind of pick them out, but that's okay. When you bake them, you won't really see them. I'm just a little compulsive like that. Okay, so yeah, so that's that. And then what I'll do is I'll give it another little wash in the section without seeds, just to kind of, that one got a, that was a big one. That was a pump, I mean a sunflower seed. And that is, Jewish food's name, which is hollow within a holla. And then that, it'll be very, it's very so pretty. beautiful. Wait, wait, Cheryl, hold it up one more time. I want to take a picture sure. of it. Hollow within a holla. It's so different. beautiful. Hollow within a holla. I am definitely. on Jewish food. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be I trying. I love that. I tell everybody that. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys got to go read the article. It's hollow within a holla. I saw that. I was like, that's so cool. Um, and this, I'll post these. I will definitely post these so you can see the big. So if you're not already following Cheryl on Instagram, please follow her. She's Nomad Bakery. And every time I see her creations or videos, I'm always inspired. So I would highly, um, I would highly suggest that. Okay, hold on. We have a couple of questions that are coming in because people miss them. The, what was the, um, what was the internal temperature when you take 100? Um, I go for 195. Okay. Some 190 to 195. Like, it, like a little less. I, I, I find it's feathery and I like the exterior 195. And um, her Instagram handle is Nomad Bakery. Nomad Bakery. She's based in New Hampshire. Everyone should go and follow her. Thank you guys so much for um, a wonderful class. Um, Cheryl, thank you so, so, so much for sharing your time with us once again. And um, I want to wish everybody Shana Tova, healthy, happy new year, and make sure to share your beautiful round hall creations with us either on Instagram, tag Jewish food and tag Cheryl Nomad Bakery, or come to our Facebook group, the Nosher Baking and Cooking group, and share your photos. We really would love to see um, what you guys create.